The aspersions about Cooper Legal being motivated to seek a settlement for a client so as to gain another income stream are completely unfair. Cooper Legal were doing the right thing trying to resolve the case outside of court. The comments also show ignorance on the part of Crown civil servants as to how money is earned if one is not on a salary. For the record, there are staff to pay, and Cooper Legal have staff, taxes to pay, experts' expenses to pay, travel costs to pay, office rent, other office expenses, ACC payments. Senior counsel undertaking legal aid earn $149 an hour with caps on the number of hours. The reason why Cooper Legal seems to have so much of the market in historic abuse cases, which appears to be very irritating to the Crown, uh, that reason seems to have escaped the Crown Law Office. In fact, the vast majority of civil lawyers will not do civil legal aid as they consider it not possible to make a living out of it. And I, once again, speaking in my role as um, access to justice in the Bar Association, I think there are 35 practising civil legal aid lawyers out of 16,000 in New Zealand. It is a major crisis. Um, providing representation for people. So the solution, the obvious solution, is in the hands of the Crown Law Office. If it wants to open up the market, it needs to tell the government, it has the government here more than anyone, to increase the legal aid rate. So the big question is why the Crown missed so many opportunities to do it differently? Why have they missed the mark so widely and created so much suffering in the process? It's submitted that the answer lies in the fact there is a complete lack of a human rights culture or a tiriti culture within the Crown Law Office and consequently within government departments. There is a severe deficit in this area within the office, at least when Crown Law Office is outward looking, and I'm not saying anything about their employment policies, and I'm sure they're very good and supportive um, in all sorts of ways when they're looking at their own staff. I'm talking about the outward approach to claimants and other people. When the Attorney General enacted Part 1A of the Human Rights Act in 2001, it was with the intention of developing a human rights culture within the New Zealand civil service so that human rights would no longer just be used in a, as an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff model. Rather, it would infuse and inculcate thinking at the policy development stage onwards. And the former Chief Human Rights Commissioner, who gave evidence at the first hearing, demonstrates that there's been a hostility to human rights claims emanating from the Crown Law Office, just as the evidence has shown there's been a hostility to historic abuse claims from the Crown Law Office. In conclusion, the evidence shows that it was the Crown Law Office all along that's been the problem with historic abuse cases. Many today are still suffering huge ne negative impacts from taking claims against the Crown. And those people who have received the walking boots or whatever else they've got from the Ministry of Social Development, they have not been rehabilitated, even if their cases have settled. And I am sure and I believe that the personal meetings that people have and what the Solicitor General said about how impressed she was, I believe that they have been very helpful to people to finally have an official hear what you say, believe you and say that was really wrong. That is a hugely healing process. But they have not been rehabilitated, as is the Crown's duty under its international human rights obligations. The Crown Law Office owes a fulsome apology to survivors in, in abuse for the strategy and tactics it has developed 
it had developed until recently. The final part of my submission is on the future, providing an effective remedy to all survivors. <coughs> it's submitted that there's not been fair or adequate rehabilitation or compensation for state survivors of abuse, though there appear to be signs of it developing within the MSD, um, some signs. The levels of compensation are mostly shamefully inadequate, inconsistent, and unaligned with the masses, massive losses suffered by most, for example, loss of educational opportunity, vocational training opportunities, earning potential, loss of enjoyment of life, diminished enjoyment of relationships and family life, diminished mental, emotional and psychological well-being. Until now, there's been no public inquiry or full government understanding of the systemic nature of the suffering of children and young persons in its care, and it's possibly the lack of full exposure to this which has meant empathy has been lacking in government responses to them. As I've said, it's only through Sir Rodney's unsolicited report that the details of Lake Hallis became public knowledge. Dr Leakes has never been held to account in the criminal courts. Um, the CLAS has provided some rehabilitation for persons through listening and linking them up with support services. However, it was tied to what it could provide and it was not its role and did not consider or make provision on what was needed to actually rehabilitate the individual survivor to improve their quality of life. A most vexing fact of the compensation process for survivors, other than Lake Callis to this point, is that the Crown Law Office and its government client government departments have been fact finder, then determiner of the quantum, while at the same time employed by and answerable to um, answerable to and representing the interests of the government which failed to protect the child. It's all hopelessly conflicted. Essentially, the Crown Law Office cannot meet the government's human rights obligation to the survivors while defending the government from liability for breaches of those human rights obligations to the survivors. In Leone's case and others, there has been no contest. The primary, if not sole duty, is perceived to be to protect the government per strings. And I thought that came through very strongly even though the Solicitor General got what the claimants were saying, understood it, understood their trauma very well, she still did not see that actually it was a responsibility of the Crown itself to look at ways of making redress for that trauma. Now, this may seem an, a strong submission to make, but it is on instructions. It's submitted that no one who has acted as Crown Counsel in the area of historic claims in the past should be able to be appointed to any leadership or decision-making positions within a new body. Likewise, and maybe this has to be softened, but no public servants in government departments who have worked in the area of compensation for claimants should be so employed. Unfortunately, there's such a level of distrust and anger towards the Crown Law Office and government officers among many survivors, not all, but many, that the credibility of the body would be seriously compromised were such persons to be appointed. There would be real concerns as to whether former loyalties and ways of thinking could be altered. And I'll just move on now because um, the final point, the request for the Commission to make an interim report. The group of Lake Alice survivors urged the Royal Commission to forward an interim report to government recommending the establishment of a properly funded independent body entirely separate from the Crown Law Office to take over the work of assessing claims and providing appropriate rehabilitation and allocating compensation for survivors of abuse in state care with a sizeable increase in monies available for allocation. I note there the Australian Royal Commission had recommended 200,000 be about, I haven't looked it in detail, but I understand about an average figure. The government legislated it down to 150,000, and that would 
also from that would be deducted monies already received. Do you think in that regard, and you would have heard the discussion that I had with uh, Crown Council today, uh, should be uh, um, mitigated in any way by the ACC regime? Well, thank you for raising that, Ma'am. I mean, ACC for survivors of abuse, it's good on the counselling. It's absolutely pathetic on anything else. To get earnings-related compensation is extremely difficult because these people cannot show that they were ever able to be employed well. The only person I'm aware of for, who has got earnings-related compensation for sexual abuse is a woman who was in, working in a, in a job, a respectable job in television, and one day her boss's husband came in and he was the, ma the man who had raped her and as a young adolescent and she just could not work anymore. Now that took a long time but she got it but she could show that she'd been capable of earning a high amount of living. These poor people have never been capable of holding, often holding down sustained employment even. If they've got severe post-traumatic distress disorder, they can't take um, orders from people, they can't take instructions from bosses, they're so super sensitive to being told off, and, um, they, and they suffer claustrophobia. So they don't have any chance, and I know we're happy to provide evidence on this if the tribunal could, I appreciate this is just evidence from the bar, but I completely support what Cooper Legal say about ACC does not work, from my experience, in the vast majority of cases. If you do lump sum compensation's gone, if you do get, uh, I sat in on one person who got um, determined that he did have permanent post-traumatic stress disorder, and he, could, he did no longer had to be on the WINS job seeker allowance, but he gets, for a family of five living in extreme poverty in a series of shacks north of Auckland, he gets 570 a quarter as compensation for what he suffered, which was a sexual abuse in, in the Catholic Church. Right. Well, we can't hear too much evidence no. from the bar, obviously, although you know, we're not in a truly adversarial mm. situation. But it, it, encapsulating this is it your submission that if ACC is to be taken into account when settling the quantum at a, what you submit as a realistic level, there has to be a reassessment of the compensation that ACC gives before that can happen. Definitely. I mean, ACC was a scheme set up for people in work and people who'd had car accidents. It, suddenly when this huge discovery of how widespread sexual abuse has been in the community came out, they covered it, the government covered it, but it doesn't fit all that comfortably in there. A lot of people think, you know, it was just put in really probably to stop a whole lot of claims, but, um, and then it was, it was very much related to sexual abuse only, and then it was retrospectively impacted on everyone. Um, and then we have the issues about mental, uh, compensation for mental um, trauma, etc. Yes. Which is, I believe, is problematic as well. It is problematic. There, there are a lot of issues in the ACC field, but frankly, it's a joke to say that it provides proper rehabilitation and compensation for someone whose life has been blighted by the abuse that they suffered as a child. So, so sometimes we hear that um, ACC, because we're so sui generis with our ACC scheme, that looking at comparative models in other common law jurisdictions may not be as useful because they're not a direct comparison. No, they're not. The, I mean, who wants to go back to litigation all the time? It, it's a terrible process um, to resolve. The no-fault thing, but it was for motor car accidents, other accidents, workplace accidents, and it has been broken into by workplace health and safety. That's one piece of legislation where you can now get compensation if you're killed, um, and, for example, forestry worker. You can actually seek compensation from the courts under that legislation, even though there's ACC. So there are, in 
you know, ways you can go. And, and I would definitely suggest that there could be some way that people who had been subject to the type of abuse that we see here um, could have their claims looked at, particularly the earnings-related aspect of them.